Okay, afternoon everybody. Uh, I'm assuming you can all hear me okay? Good? Okay. So welcome to the talk. What I want to cover today is you have Drupal, why do you need a CDN? Now I'm not going to take anything for granted. Uh, I work at a company that uses acronyms for everything. Does everyone know what a CDN is? No? A few sh shakes of the head at the back. So a CDN is a content delivery network. Um, I work for one of those, so I guess I should disclaim that for not right up front. Um, essentially think of a CDN as like a global cache, okay? Probably the best way of talking about it, and we'll go into a little bit more detail around some of the features of a CDN afterwards. So what I want to cover is a little bit of a CDN 101 introduction, um, what CDNs are, um, the primary use case for a CDN, and then we're going to look at two main things, performance and security. We're going to dig into caching, uh, images and protocols on performance side, and then on the security side, we're going to look at WAF, DDoS, and BOTS. Told you we like an acronym, right? Um, we'll go into the meanings of all of those as we go through. So let's start then. A uh, little disclaimer here then. So I'm at a Drupal conference. I thought, you know, this is my first ever Drupal conference, first time in Finland. Come here, want to make some friends. And I think the next slide may upset a few people. So I just wanted to kind of get that out there right now. I'm not a horrible person. I'm well aware of where I am, but um, when I got the invite to come out here, I thought, okay, what do we normally talk about when I come to events like this? And I talk about performance. I am a performance specialist on the web. Um, so I asked a few of our customers, I said, well, you know, you, always, you use Drupal. What are your kind of big concerns? What do you not like about Drupal? Um, and I did a little bit of research as well. And what I found, um, and it's not hard to go and find lots of people moaning about this, is there are two big complaints I hear from customers and from uh, doing a bit of research online. One is um, performance, and the other one is the back-end processing. Now, before I get like thrown out of the room, is that valid? Is that like, do people experience those problems when you're using Drupal? Yeah, so I'm not wrong. You don't hate me. Good. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so this was interesting from my standpoint because, like I said to you earlier, I'm a, I focus um, at, our, at Akamai on, on web performance. And part of my day job is worrying about why websites aren't fast and also exploring the business relationship between a slow website and what that means for your end users. And there has been a lot of study around, you know, a slow website will in increase bounce rate, lower conversion, and obviously on the flip side, if you improve the performance of your website, you're gonna get better engagement from customers and you're gonna get better conversion on a commerce website. So this was kind of music to my ears. When I heard these two, two main complaints from a lot of people, I was like, this is great because this is kind of what a CDN can help with. So let's dig in a little bit around what a CDN is and how that can help in this situation. So this is a kind of a 101 lesson of what happens when someone makes a request to your website. And in this example, we've got mobile phone. So user makes a request to your website. That goes from their mobile phone to a cell tower somewhere, and then some magic happens, and eventually they land on the internet. For those of you who have never kind of explored what the internet looks like, it's a gray cloud like this for this example. Once the request traverses the internet, it will then go to your back end, okay? So your Drupal server will then receive that request and then respond to that request. Send that back out from your data center, or maybe you're using the cloud, send that back out onto the kind of open internet, that then traverses back across the internet and down to the end user's device. Simple, okay? That's, that's kind of what happens. Now, with a CDN, essentially, same user makes the same request, but this time, the CDN has a, a giant network of servers that exist around the world, and the idea is that they exist close to those end users. So rather than the request now having to traverse all the way across the internet, it can now just go directly to the nearest CDN server and then respond to that request. Now from a performance standpoint, this is great because the biggest killer of performance for websites is latency. The further something is away from where you're requesting it, the longer it's gonna take. It's just physics, okay? Um, I think from uh, what I remember is from, from my school days is the speed of light is basically the fastest data can travel down a cable, give or take the refractive index of the cable it's going down. So I was paying attention in physics, and I've shared that all with you. So. This is great, um, and I'm sure all of you are sitting there thinking, well, that's fantastic, but I kind of do some back-end processing on my, um, con my requests that come in. This is fantastic if I've got static content. Now, static content is stuff that doesn't change, that you can just store versions of it around the world on a CDN and then 
use this model. Now, that's, that's not always the case. What if someone's logged in and there's some dynamic content? What if you're processing an order? You actually need to do that processing on your back end. Now, this is where a CDN can help as well. So not just with the dynamic, con uh, the static content, all your images and CSS files, JavaScript files, but also the dynamic content as well. Oh, I should have mentioned as well, the advantages of using a CDN is not only do you get the better performance, which we've already discussed, but you also get the benefit of a, a, a price reduction in your traffic because depending on where you're hosting, there will be infrastructure costs and there is a, also a bandwidth cost. So I don't know if you are paying for a fixed line into your data center. Well, the traffic is then reduced. So you can then handle more traffic at less cost. So let's go back to the dynamic content stuff. So sometimes the shortest route is not always the fastest route, okay? So if we take the example here of this bridge, um, it doesn't look very stable, it doesn't really look very safe, and it would probably take you a little bit of time to get across that um, because you're basically climbing. Um, it might be quicker to kind of walk around and find another bridge or do something like that. Now, what the hell has this got to do with CDNs, I hear you ask? Um, essentially, we can do something similar when we're routing dynamic traffic across the internet. So for those of you, uh, again, who have never really delved into what the internet looks like, just kind of taking it for granted that it works, the internet is a basically a network of networks, okay? So it's a bunch of um, like providers such as Verizon, Level 3, AT&T, that own certain networks within the internet, and they trade off and pass traffic from one to the other. Now, in an ideal world, that traffic would always be sent through with no politics whatsoever, and it would always go the fastest route. However, politics exist on the internet, and things like costs come into play. So it might be cheaper for one provider to hand off all their traffic to another provider. So they would maybe send most of their traffic the cheapest way rather than the fastest way. Um, we also get things where things break. I'm sure you all work in technology, and you know that they break all the time. Um, and we also get congestion. Um, you know, sometimes there are periods when things are busy on the internet. Um, and it's actually one of the reasons why a CDN and Akamai was actually invented nearly 20 years ago, is the whole problem of the internet back in those days was that no one went on the internet unless there was something interesting happening. But the trouble was, at that point, everyone went on the internet. So before CDNs, you had the WWW was standing for the worldwide wait. Um, so that was one of the problems that CDNs tried to solve back in the early days. So what would we do then in this, in this instance here? that if I was routing traffic around the internet, I suddenly got a black spot, whether it's from uh, an, in, uh, an outage or, um, or just congestion maybe. What we can do with dynamic requests is we can use our own infrastructure, our own servers to actually reroute traffic. We don't have to just let in traffic go across the internet in its normal state, and we can start routing around problems. And we've seen this in the past, both in like natural disasters when there's been earthquakes and things like that, or when like some little old lady in the Eastern Europe has kind of been doing some gardening and severed through a cable in her back garden. Um, and believe me, it does happen. So that's, that's kind of a CDN in a nutshell, okay? So we can do the caching of static content, and we can also accelerate dynamic content as well. But we can also do go layer deeper in advanced caching. And I think there's a session this afternoon or tomorrow about caching as well, which I'd be interested to see what they've got to say. But let's go through a couple of examples of caching and see how you can cache more than you're probably caching today. Because again, caching is one of the, the best things we can do to not only improve the performance, but protect that back end from getting too many requests. So first thing then is uh, if we imagine a nice, simple kind of e-commerce wireframe here, we've got our website. We've got someone's not logged in. They've got the login button. So they're not logged in. And so historically, this home page, we might not cache this. We might say, well, the actual request for the HTML is dynamic. It's the home page. We can't cache that. Um, but if someone's not logged in, then that's fine. And if they've got no items in their basket, that's fine too. So essentially, this could be cached. And this is an anonymous user. So often, like I say, people will make the assumption they can't cache something because there may be at some point something dynamic happening on that page. But until I log in or add something to my basket, I'm going to be seeing exactly the same as everyone else when they see this page. So that's an example how you could cache something. Let's dig into another example then. So same, same e-commerce thing again. This time, still the user's not logged in, but actually they do have an item in their basket now. So can we cache this? dare someone to answer. <laughs> no? Can we cache it? Yes. How would you cache it? Uh, I would cache the page and then it's all through some kind of 
You've, you've gone like five steps ahead, wow. <laughs> okay, so the answer there was to basically cache it and have something on the front end that would then bring that, that basket in. But let's go a little bit more simple than that. We'll come to that, that's a, a very good answer. And we've got an example of that coming up. But essentially, we could create user groups. What's the difference in this page if someone's got one basket, one item in their basket? It's the same for every user who's got one item in this basket because all we're showing is a counter in the top. We're not showing them the basket, we're just showing them that they've got one item. So it's exactly the same. Now, you could do that, you could then cache a version for everyone with one item, two items, three items, four items, and so on, right? So now we're creating groups of users and caching based on those groups. Okay, let's go for another example then. So this time, now we've got a welcome back. I've logged in. So I know that this person's logged in, but again, it's not personalized, it's just saying welcome back. It's nothing to me personally. Um, and now, I also know that I've got some items in a basket. And again, we could reuse this idea of user groups. So now we're starting to think of like, if I'd have said five minutes ago, would you ever cache a page when someone was logged in? You'd have probably said no way on, the, on earth would we do that, right? That's, that's just not what we want to do. So again, we've got this concept now of kind of cacheable groups and we can explore that. Now let's go for the full personalized experience. It now says, welcome back, Michael. Now, I'm not suggesting that we start caching a version for everyone who's called Michael and then every name that you ever see. I don't think that's going to be realistic. But going back to what this guy said over here is we've got our personalized welcome. We can start using fragments of our page. Okay. Now, you're right. You could do it in the client side with things like Ajax. So asynchronous requests going back from the page and getting the dynamic and the personalized content. Or um, we could use a... Um, a technique called ESI, which edge side includes, which basically breaks the page up into fragments and we could have a cacheable page minus the fragments that are dynamic. And in this example, it's the, the kind of personalization at the top. Now, this is fine because in Drupal, you have regions and blocks and you could basically apply ESI completely around a, a block of code. Um, and that would give you the personalization that you need. Now, what we could do is cache this whole base page and the only bit of information that we're having to send back across the internet is just the little fragment that's dynamic, okay? So this is, again, how we could solve and just start caching more. And that's, again, something I work with a lot of customers is just reviewing how much offload, we call it, are they getting from their origin server. And we see some customers with over 95% offload of requests that are being managed by the cache and never getting back to the server itself both in terms of number of hits and in terms of the volume of the data it's serving as well. Who uses on-premise caching? Who uses Varnish? Most people, it's kind of like, a, anyone use something else? Anyone got like um, F5s and things like that? Got a bit of a mixture going on. <laughs> cool, so again, a lot of people say to us, well, I have on-premise cache, why, why would I use a CDN? And Again, the answer here is the CDN is primarily focused on the latency, so an on-premise cache won't help with that. It will help protect your, your Drupal server, but it still won't handle um, the issue around users being a long way away from that, um, that server. So what I also find, though, is people who have their on-premise caches, they don't always tie up, so they have a lot of rules that are on their on-premise cache that then don't marry up to what's actually happening on the CDN, and this is another state that causes performance issues. Um, we had a Canadian company that we spent about a week just synchronizing the rules they had locally with the rules they had in the CDN, and they saw about one or two second improvement in their page load times because they just found that they weren't caching enough. So inspired by this use case, we actually created a, 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 a connector for Varnish. So if you are using Varnish and you're using Akamai, um, quick question, by the way, is anyone actually here an Akamai customer? <laughs> so I know you guys are. Should I back up a minute? Has anyone ever heard of Akamai? Cool, okay, so not many people. So like I said at the beginning, Akamai is a CDN and that's, that's the one I choose for. So we, we decided to create a, a varnish connector, it's called, which gives you the ability to then synchronize your local cache with your CDN cache. Um, so some of the things that it can do is obviously you can do your purging instantly from both caches at the same time and you can do your rules. And also if you are using things like ESI, then you can defer the loading of that ESI to the CDN rather than running it at both layers as well. So, lots of cool stuff there to really integrate your local caches with then your global caches, which I would call a CDN as well. Okay, let's dig in then a little bit on performance. So, images is something I wanted to cover first of all. So, 
when we talk about images and optimizing images, I'm sure you're probably all going to turn around and tell me that there's already some modules that do that in Drupal. Who uses those modules today? Anyone? Anyone optimize images? Does anyone even do anything with images or do they just put them on the site and let them go as they are when they come through to you? Okay, so why are images important? Well, if we have a look at our websites, images make up the largest part of our website. So if we're gonna try and speed up our websites, where's the best place to start? Images, right? If they're making up on average 66%, so I think this is taken from the top 100,000 websites in the world. Um, it's a pretty good place to start because if we can start shaving off some of the bytes and the performance of those images, we're going to have a really good impact on our page overall. Now, what formats of image does people use? So quick question, like who uses JPEGs on their website? Anyone use PNGs for product images? Anyone use, why do you use PNGs for product images? Do they have transparent backgrounds? Some of them depends on the client. Yeah, okay. So this again, so PNGs generally will be a lot bigger than a JPEG when they're compressed on the internet, um, which can lead to a performance overhead. Now PNGs are great because they offer transparency. So if you've got a product that's like going on different colored backgrounds and things like that, then that can work really well. Um, but you'll see the majority of images served on the web are, are, are JPEGs, and that kind of makes sense. Um, but really disappointing for me is WebP. Can you see this little... 1% of this pie um, is WebP. Now, who's heard of WebP? Who uses WebP? Okay, not many people. Um, now, WebP is basically JPEGs, but new. Um, now, these stats were all taken from Chrome, which is why there's no other formats on here that are also new. But the JPEG is about 20 years old. And if we think about what we know today versus what we knew 20 years ago, we know a lot more stuff nowadays, right? Um, 20 years ago was quite a long time. And there are better formats for serving images on the internet today. So WebP is an example of one of these. Um, developed by Chrome or Google and brilliantly only supported in Chrome, not supported in Safari and IE, which is probably a reason why the adoption has been pretty limited. Now, the IE and Safari browsers also have their own versions, JPEG 2000 and JPEG XR. Now, the advantage to these newer formats is they are about 30% smaller than normal images. So if we go and look at the size of our web page and take this 66% images and made them all 30% smaller, we'd bring that down to 40% straight away. No loss in quality whatsoever. Now, some of those modules that I mentioned earlier on, um, on Drupal don't actually deal with the newer formats. So again, a CDN could help you by detecting the right format to serve and then serving the right image. Okay. Who optimizes images by just reducing the quality? So anyone using any of those modules, there is the ability to decrease the quality of an image. Now, that sounds pretty scary. And I'm sure if anyone here is like a marketing person, you'd be like, whoa, hang on a minute. I'm not having my images like a lower quality than they need to be. But actually, the human eye isn't really that intelligent and we don't really detect that much in terms of differences in some of the qualities. So what a lot of people tend to do is just reduce the quality down to an arbitrary value of like 90 or 80 or something like that. And if I should sort of show you this example of the watch, now I'm really nervous on this one. Is this not kind of working, is it? Um, really nervous on this one because I never know what kind of projector we're gonna get when we come to these presentations. So I don't really know the quality of the image as it looks now. So let's just think, this is a high quality image. It looks great, it's a blue watch, right? And we start reducing the quality. Can anyone see a difference yet? Not really, and uh, we're probably down at around the 70 mark of this quality now. Um, if any marketing people, they're probably about to fall off their chairs. I say, what about now? Because this is about a quality of 50, and I can't see the difference. And I think when we go right down, now I can see a difference. Did you all notice that last one? We can really see some kind of blurring on the front here now. Now, this is known as compression of JPEGs. It's lossy compression. So what we do is we throw away some of the, the fidelity of the image. Now, that's fine, but what some people do, like I say, is they just take an arbitrary value and say, okay, we're gonna convert all of our images into a sort of a value of 80. So that's fine. Um, but what we've found is not every image is the same. 
Sometimes, if you convert an image to a level of 80, you'll see that horrible pixelation that we saw in that previous example down the bottom of the range. Or, sometimes, you could get an image that you could compress all the way down to like 30 or 40, and it would still look great. So what you'd end up doing is you're kind of compromising either on quality or you're missing out on bytes that you could shave off. Um, so what we've done is we've done some maths, basically. And so this is an algorithm where we look at what's known as the structural similarity of an image. So for every single image as a CDN that comes through our platform, we can just take it to one side and run some analysis and see at what point does the human eye start to detect a difference. So this is an image that I took off the, um, the Finland uh, tourist board website. Um, does anyone know where this is? Tomorrow's after party. Right? That's, that's the pool, is it? Wow, there you go. Okay, so what we can do then is start looking at the difference. So when we start degrading the quality, this, this image on the right is basically the, the delta, the heat map of what we've changed. So by applying this algorithm, and I'm not gonna test anyone on this, so don't worry, you don't have to learn it. Um, a, a, a disclaimer as well, I have no idea what all of these symbols mean. I just know it's like some complicated maths. Um, so by doing this, we can then start compressing an image as much as we can before the human eye can tell a difference, okay? So with this one, this image, I managed to make the image 14% smaller by going down to a quality level of 76, okay? So like I said, if you'd have been compressing that to 90 or 80, you'd have been missing out on bytes. If you'd have been going to 70, you'd have probably compressed it too much that it's actually not gonna be as high quality as you'd have wanted. Okay, so I mentioned formats before, um, just to recap here. So we, historically, we've normally used JPEGs for our images on the web, and that's been supported by all browsers. Um, you've got JPEG XR, JPEG 2000, and WebP now, and these are the corresponding browsers that support those. And as I mentioned earlier, about 30% different, maybe. Um, this example, by converting to WebP, made it 22% different, okay? So this is a, an example where a CDN can layer on um, and, and do certain things that maybe your modules can't and you can't do at the back end because of obviously the, the processing involved in doing some of this. Um, the second side of things is the storage as well. So um, the more images you create, so obviously if you're now gonna create a different format of every image for each browser type, that's a lot more storage you're gonna have to handle. So again, a CDN can help you with that. Um, essentially, it's the cloud, the magic cloud, so we can store things for you there, okay? What about protocols? Anyone here use HTTP2? Well, half a hand, kind of in the process of migrating. Cool. Anyone else? Anyone sitting there thinking HTTP what? No? Everyone's kind of heard of HTTP2? Again, for those of you who haven't, HTTP is the fundamental protocol that the internet works on. Um, and HTTP 1.1 was about 15, it's about 15 years old. And as I mentioned earlier, we kind of know a lot of stuff and a lot of things are different from 15 years ago, especially the internet. There was no Google 15 years ago, no eBay, no Facebook, um, no Skype, no videoing over, over the internet, no internet banking, no Amazon. You know, fundamentally things were massively different. So the internet has changed a lot and obviously the protocol hasn't changed with it. So HTTP2 is the kind of industry answer to try and address the modern web. Anyone use IPv6? Anyone sitting there thinking IPv what? Okay, IPv6, um, you may have heard about this. Um, IPv4 is our IP addresses. Everyone familiar with the IP addresses that we, we know today, sort of a number, dot, number, dot, number, dot, number. Um, we're running out. Big story, a few years ago, maybe a little bit scaremongering, um, but essentially at some point we will run out of addresses. A lot of addresses are being recycled and coming back into circulation, but there's been a lot of talk that at some point we will run out, so we now have IPv6. Now, if we look at some examples of, of these, um, Facebook used IPv6, and they actually experienced 15% faster connection times for their mobile users. And, and why is that? Well, essentially, IPv6 is new, so any traffic going over an IPv6 network is going to have newer hardware, but also if you're coming from an IPv6 device, which most mobile phones are today, you then have to be downgraded to IPv4 if your website doesn't support it. Okay, now that downgrading incurs a cost in terms of performance and that's why it's slower. So being able to support IPv6 addresses on your website 
is something that's really um, can give you a boost in terms of performance for mobile users. So again, using a CDN, you can just flip this on and let the CDN manage that for you. And you don't have to worry about upgrading your infrastructure and managing that yourself. Um, Nespresso, uh, a company, a customer of ours that uh, turned on HTTP2 and their website got 50% faster. So small caveat here, don't expect this to be the case for your website. Um, if you ever had to build a, a default kind of like, like lab-based environment of a website that would benefit from HTTP2, you would have built the Nespresso website. Um, however, let's not deny that H2 can make your website faster. So again, if you've got a CDN, you could just flip a switch and turn that on. No upgrading of infrastructure, um, no new kind of like managing old and new and things like that. It's just a flip of a switch. Okay, just gonna move on then to a little bit of security as well, because another benefit you get from using a CDN is, is you get enhanced security options available to you. So what the first one is WAF, Web Application Firewall. So basically just think firewall, but think based on the web. Um, does anyone use a WAF product today? Does anyone use any of the Drupal built-in modules for security that do things like cross-site scripting and SQL injection and things like that? Okay, yes. <laughs> um, so essentially, this is, for what ha this is needed for when bad guys come to try and do things to your site, either to deface your site or to maliciously try and get some value from it, whether it be hacking in to get usernames or just um, maybe they're just kind of kids in their bedroom playing around. But essentially, if you just have your kind of standard Drupal openly accessing the internet, um, the bad guys come along and they start attacking your infrastructure, okay? Now, the advantage to a CDN is obviously you have a layer between you and or your Drupal in instance and the outside world. And essentially, the bad traffic then gets, it first encounters you know, the, the web at the edge of our network, nowhere near yours. And we can deal with it for you there. So they're not gonna be tying up resources. So if, if people are trying to just like, not hack per se, but maybe they're just trying to um, assess your site for vulnerabilities and things like that, then you, need, you can do that away from the, like, your infrastructure at the edge of our network, and then you don't see the overhead in that around this kind of slow performance and the high back-end responses. DDoS, next acronym. Anyone familiar with this? Distributed denials of service. Now, this is a market where you can actually now go on a website, and there are certain companies that offer SLAs to DDoS other people's websites. So you can pay someone to attack someone's website. Um, and essentially, a, a DDoS attack is basically, um, I'm just gonna throw loads of traffic at your site until it falls over. And there's a few organizations that are, are now organized crime organizations that will do this for Bitcoins. They will, they will bribe, uh, sorry, bribe, they will blackmail you um, and try to get money from you, extort money from you by threatening to DDoS your website and take it down. So what they would normally do is run a small test for an hour, maybe half an hour, to show they can do it. And then you would get an email. Um, I think it's uh, D4BC, DDoS for Bitcoin is the name of the company. There's also the, another group called the Amada Collective that are quite big as well. And essentially, you get your first attack, lasts about half an hour, and then you get an email saying, you'll have noticed last week, we took your site down, we took it offline. Um, and if you don't give us a certain amount of Bitcoins, we're gonna do it again. Now, where does a CDN help with this? Uh, essentially, the way in which they attack your site is by basically filling up your bandwidth. So if you've got a single pipe going into a server somewhere, then if it's a one gig pipe, all they need to do is send one gig per second of traffic and essentially no one else will be able to get on that site because you'll just be maxing out the requests on the, on the bandwidth available. So that's not great. And it's also very costly to try and handle that on premise because either the end you have two or three different um, uh, connections to the internet for your servers, which again can have a, a cost associated, or you start trying to layer something in front of that, but then where does that sit? Because at some point there's still that single point of vulnerability. If you use a CDN, again, all of this traffic just gets sucked up into the edge of our platform. Um, and we see billions of requests per second anyway. So there haven't been too many DDoS attacks um, that have actually caused us any 
any kind of worry about scale. We're going in and out again. Is that better? Okay. Um, so generally speaking, like I say, it's very hard um, for, for these people to generate the type of bandwidth that they would need to, to worry a CDN when they're, when they're doing that. Um, we also have four scrubbing centers around the world where we can just take that bad traffic and just basically put it in a pot and get rid of it when we see it. Um, the other advantage to a CDN is we see, like I say, billions of requests every day. Um, and we can start using that information. We can collect data about IP addresses. We know when someone's been doing something malicious on one customer website, if they then pop up on another customer's website, we might know that that's not gonna be a trusted IP address and we can start blocking it straight away, keeping it well away from your infrastructure. Okay, so next thing then is bots as well. Same kind of thing. So um, has anyone ever kind of looked at the traffic on their own website and seen how much of it is real? I think we heard someone talking earlier about the innovation and they're saying about like chat, chat bots. And now when you go onto a customer service like thing, you think you're talking to someone, don't you, sometimes? But nine times out of 10, it's not. It's, it's a bot. It's someone actually prog programmatically replying to your questions. Um, so I always like ask them what their favorite color is and things like that to try and see if I can see if they're real or not. Because sometimes you just want to talk to a person, right? So we did some analysis on websites um, and on the average, only about 60% of the traffic you see on your website is, is from real users. Now, just because it's coming from someone that's not real doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing or not. So if we think about some good bots, um, Google, index your pages and then your pages appear high on Google search results. That is an example of a good bot. Um, we want to let Google scan your pages. Um, however, a competitor scanning your pages and pulling out the prices so they can undercut you is an example of a bad bot, okay? And there are other bots as well. So um, one of the big things we're seeing at the moment is credential abuse. So we see bots just trying to log in with a list of username and passwords that they, maybe they've seen from other websites or they've bought on the dark web from other websites. So when we hear reports of, um, you know, a, a website losing user credentials. I think PlayStation was an example a few years ago. Um, that can affect you because now people will buy that information on the internet and they'll just start using bots to come to your website and start plugging them in. And if they get a hit, great, because now they can get into their accounts and they can start doing all sorts with it. So, you know, just because you hear about a data breach in another customer doesn't mean say you shouldn't worry about it as well. So that's an example where a bot is a bad idea. So what can we do to deter people or bots um, coming to our website? Now, you could just block the traffic, um, but that doesn't always work because you know the kind of old story around a, a barrel with a leak, a barrel full of water with a leak and you plug one hole and then there's another one and you plug that one. It's kind of the same thing with bots. If you just block a bot based on its IP address, it will just change IP address and it will come back the next day. Um, so you need to kind of start learning and using the information that you can to try and work with the bots but without giving them what they want. Okay. So we call this bot management rather than just bot blocking. Um, and the idea here would be you would have some strategic plans in place. So you might just want to slow down the response. You might want to serve the bot some cached information. If they're trying to scan your prices, just send them a cache page where all the prices are zero dollars or euros. So there's no value in that information for them. Um, you know, trying to do that is, is better than just blocking. So again, a CDN can help with that because we're seeing so much traffic, we can help identify those bots. And again, we can start managing them well away from your infrastructure. So if we go back to the, the slide or the, the, the figure of 60% real user traffic, of that other 40%, we could keep that well away from the backend infrastructure of your Drupal server so we don't have to worry about the performance and the backend processing. Okay, so let's wrap this all up then. Um, so hopefully you've all learned today, the primary purpose of a CDN is to tackle latency issues. That was why CDNs were invented in the first place. Um, and to tackle those latency issues is to tackle slow performance on the web, okay? However, um, because the CDN itself is seeing so much traffic, you can start layering on intelligent services on top of general caching 
of di uh, static content and general acceleration of dynamic content. So the example we gave you is something like image optimization. Um, it can make life a lot easier adopting new technology. There wasn't a large volume of you putting your hands up telling me you've adopted HTTP2, for, for example. Um, using a CDN can really help with that. Oh. Um, and then secondly, or finally, I think security as well. So again, the more you can offload from your origin, including bad traffic, the better you're going to give, better experience you're going to give to your genuine real users. So again, handling security away from those uh, can be useful. And then also the scale. A scale that CDN gives you is something that you, is going to be very costly for you to try and replicate yourself. So you can take advantage of the scale of the CDN um, and you can deal with kind of growing threats. Like I say, you know, more and more uh, groups nowadays, you know, trying to do bad things on the internet, whether it's just bring your site down through a, a flood of traffic or whether they're trying to extort you for usernames or trying to get those usernames or trying to try other usernames on their site and, and get in to get some sensitive data. So they're the five main points. Um, so now you know um, why there is value in using a CDN on top of Drupal. Um, Basically, a CDN and Drupal would work together for faster, more secure user experiences. So, does anyone have any questions? Lots of questions. Is mixed. Yeah, so, thanks for all this nice information <laughs> about the intelligence services because uh, uh, we at Sealy, they mentioned all, also on the board, uh, I'm, I'm Matt, hi, so we're, we're using it mainly for, for tackling latency in our, in our international websites that we're building for our customers. Uh, uh, but still, I, I have a couple of questions because we actually haven't been using Akamai as, as a provider, so, but what? But I can shout. Yeah. The thing is that um, we have a couple of customers that um, have also sites in China, and I noticed that, that you have some kind of a location, some some kind of a location in China. Yeah. But, but is it actually a, a content delivery? Or, or not? Absolutely. So there are dedicated Chinese CDNs that exist within China, because obviously the problem with China, for those of you who don't know, is traffic going in and out of China is heavily uh, monitored and it can be very slow. Um, we actually have a Chinese entity, so we have a separate product called China CDN. Um, we also, now Russia has become a new problem as well. In the, the, the privacy laws in Russia now dictate if you want to serve encrypted content in Russia, you need to have a license to do so. Um, and also that the government at any point can get access to that key so they can decrypt the information if they want to. So it's pretty, um, you know, different regulations in different countries, but yes, we have the China thing and we also have Russia right now. Um, can you specify a bit, um, is it, is it um, just one or one? One city, one, one, do you have like a... A single edge location in China? Or no, or we'll or have or multiple. So, yeah, so there, there are, uh, we didn't really cover it today, but there's two approaches that CDN has taken. One is the super pop approach, where you would build one single data center in each country and, and just pick strategic countries to serve traffic. The other one is to go for a distributed approach. And Apple might go for the second, which is a distributed approach, because we believe that you can then end up with your service closer to those end users. So, in China, I don't know the figures, but we certainly have multiple regions. Um, and now I can show you after this, we've got a, an app where we can dig in and see exactly what we have there. Um, for everyone else, the issue with China as well is you can, you can either make two decisions about how you serve traffic. You can either serve from what we call the rim around China, so position your content around the outside of China and then go through that great firewall of China, which is subject to um, sort of monitoring delays, or you can position your content inside of China. And, and the, the question here is, is it better to distribute that? And the answer is yes, and we do. Well, then the other obvious question is that uh, a lot of Finnish companies do, do websites that are also in 
it's a reduction cost for them. So, uh, in, in Russia, it's uh, the country is, is very diverse. It's a huge country, and all the regions are uh, the networks and the connectivity is not so good. So, even if you preserve your customers in Moscow, well, it doesn't mean that they will still be so well in, in Kazan or yeah, so in Absolutely. So essentially, with the Russia story and, and the CDN as a whole, we will always look at where traffic is coming from and scale our network into those regions. Um, I'm proud to say we have an edge region in Antarctica now. Um, we had a, a, a government-sponsored thing. But uh, to be honest, if you look at our footprint in Russia, there's a lot in Moscow and a lot in St. Petersburg, and then not a lot elsewhere, because we just don't see the traffic coming from elsewhere. And again, if you go to your customers and they look at real user data, of where their customers are based, I would say 95% of them would be from Moscow and St. Petersburg. Right. So. Well, actually, we, we have a specific customer, a Finnish construction company that, that works. They have seven seven companies in Russia, and then they are they are located like locally. So typically, we think okay. about construction companies. Their customers are local. They are in Gibraltar, in Kazan, I mean, right? So, so that, that's been a real issue. So they're the five percent basically. <laughs> okay. so, but, but then, actually, the, the most important question. Akamai has at least a reputation of being very expensive. And if, if, I, if I think about the convenience of that, because we typically host our solutions in, in, in AWS, yeah. and, and their cloud front is, is, we all know that that's not the best thing, it good is enough. Not, but it's, it's <coughs> really good enough for most purposes. So yeah. what would be your pitch to me? That, uh, that what, what should I pay double for, for using Akamai instead of So I, I think it's a very valid point. Um, we hear that quite a lot. Um, what I would say is we have a hierarchy of products, and probably some of our mid to low tier products are more comparable with uh, 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 CloudFront on AWS. Um, when you start going up the product tree, is when you start getting the value adder. We kind of talked a little bit about today. Um, so, for example, like you know, in AWS, in CloudFront, and I don't want to start going to a feature parity, but there are certain things like I don't think they have a uh, staging network. For Kind of have to push things out to live, you know, maybe a set yeah, configuration yeah. stuff. So it's like little things like that that all add up, and I think there used to be uh, used to pay per purge, for example. So you know, doing a feature match is very hard. All I would say is that you know, at Akamai we have high-end products that, that come at a high-end price, um, and you need to find out where you want to sit and what's good enough for you and your customers in in that kind of in that range. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? I know there was a hand up at the back. Um, we kind of had a private meeting down here. So, uh, I think it was the same question, like, why why uh, Akamai instead of Cloudflare? So I think you answered that one. Yeah. And um, the other thing as well, as I was just saying, is it's always good at looking at reliability and everything. It's, again, it's very hard to look at that, but we offer 100% SLAs that our platform won't go down because it is distributed and, and we know and we knew when building it that things go wrong. Um, and by having a distributed network, it doesn't actually make much difference to us if certain things happen in certain regions. Um, so we can just route traffic around it, which makes a big difference if you want you know, your website to be available 100% of the time. Um, you know, again, I don't want to talk about certain competitors and things like that, but you may well find from some of those that they have outages, um, and large publicized outages as well. So you know, think about how their infrastructure is built and if there are single points of failure and things like that. Okay, any other questions? No? Okay, thank you very much.